screen's not showing. Oh, there we go. All right. Hi, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Jenny Liu. I'm a faculty member at Urban Studies and Planning, and I host this uh, transportation seminar along with uh, Dr. Chris Monsieur over at Civil Engineering. And welcome to our last Friday seminar of the term. And today, we're very happy to have um, Joe Recker with us here from TriMet. And uh, Joe has worked with TriMet's Capital Projects Division for over seven years. Um, originally, he was a transit planner, but now he is the environmental permits coordinator. And in terms of his background, he uh, got his BA in geography, and he is also an alumni of the MERP program here at PSU. So before I turn the floor over to Joe, we have another guest, uh, Phil Sillinger. Who, uh, who is working with TriMet on several uh, history-related projects that he would like to tell you guys all about and um, have an opportunity to share with you guys as well. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm stealing just a couple minutes ahead of Joe's uh, presentation um, to introduce myself. I used to work at TriMet, and I actually still work a little bit with Joe on some special projects at TriMet. And this one special project is one I'm trying to see if any of you might be interested in. Um, just a point of fact is three days ago, TriMet turned 45 years old. So TriMet has acquired quite a bit of history. And our Congressman Blumenauer has taken a particular, well, he's had a major role in that history. And he's also expressed interest in um, documenting that history. Uh, both in, with interviews and a timeline narrative and all kinds of dimensions you could imagine that would be a part of that history. One thing that the congressman specifically encouraged us to do is to uh, involve, engage students in this effort. And I, you know, that's a great idea. So that's what I'm here is to pique your interest in doing a field area paper perhaps next term uh, that might contribute to this pretty major project. Uh, we hope to have this thing put together by the end of June, so it's not a long time for us to do this. It's going to involve interviewing some of the luminaries uh, who have been a part of that history. Some of them are getting to be uh, up there in their years, so it's important that we do this now. So um, I am going to hang around uh, till the end of the presentation today. But if anyone is interested or has any ideas, even other than a field area paper, in picking out a topic, it could be a topic about the origins of TriMet, the suburban, urban, you know, push and pull. It could be the good bit, the bad, the ugly of TriMet's history. Um, it could be about the South North debacle, which was a long story of uh, the light rail development. And it could even be more current talking about how transit ties into active transportation modes. So there's lots of angles for this thing. And, uh, and I do have uh, a two-page handout summary with contact information. Professor Adler is going to be sort of the go-between, at least, between myself and, and, uh, and the student involvement. So I'm hoping some of you are interested, and I'm happy to talk to you at the end of Joe's presentation. So thank you very much. All right. Take it away, Joe. Hiring panel at TriMet. I've been at TriMet for seven years now, of that 45. Glad to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about basically before and after studies. It's a federal uh, requirement of new capital, transit capital projects. But the title that I've put is a little bit more explanatory, and it's evaluating the planning, the planning phases of projects, and the implementation of major transit capital projects. And not just the Portland region, but I'll throw in a few examples from around the country, just for comparison and similarity's sake. Uh, overview of the presentation will include a little bit of background on the New Starts, Small Starts grant process. Uh, that's the process that puts in this before and after study requirement. And then I'll talk about the before and after studies themselves, what's included in them, what you can expect if you go and look at them, uh, findings from TriMet study, and findings from other studies that I'll throw in for comparison. So first of all, the new starts, small starts process in FTA is the Federal Transit Administration. And I'll just call it new starts for the future for the sake of brevity. But it's the primary grant feature from FTA that funds transit projects in this country. So if you're a city, you're a local government uh, transit agency, and you want to build a streetcar or a light rail system 
or a subway or even a ferries, um, primarily Seattle, uh, you'll go through this grant process. And it covers new lines. So if you're a city like uh, Phoenix and you're just starting your very first light rail line, you go through this grant process. If you're in Portland, like we have, and we've gone through this process four times, five times already, actually, um, this is the program you go through. But there are some hoops. There's an evaluation criteria involved, and there's various milestones in this process. So each milestone is really determined to let FTA know that you're ready to proceed to the next step. And so each milestone is what's used to compare during these before and after studies with what's actually built. And then finally, the, the full funding grant agreement is the culmination of that process with the Federal Transit Administration. That's where you, as the local entity, commit to building this project and committing your local funds. And FTA, as the federal entity, commits to providing their share of the funding. So it's, that's the really important point at which all parties decide to press go. And then there's about $1.9 billion annually um, in this program. That doesn't seem like much when you think about some of these mega-scale projects like CRC or, or even P Portland, Milwaukee, which are in the billion-dollar range. But the, the, the money is actually distributed annually in little disbursements over the course of your project construction. So a project in Portland may get $100, $150 million per year. A project in New York City will get maybe $200, $300, or $300 million per year. And that helps fund these projects and make them a reality. So it's a very important program for the transit systems across the country. So before and after study is the requirement that you really have to pay attention to after you've completed your project. Uh, this is the, the study that the evaluation in which FTA wants to make sure that you've built what you said you were going to build, and if there were deviations, how can we learn from those? And in summary, it analyzes the project's impact after its opening, and the, the studies are usually completed about two to three years after the project opening. Uh, it evaluates the consistency of the planning uh, metrics at various points, the milestones in the new starts process. Uh, and previously, they were entry into preliminary engineering. That's a certain design phase. Uh, entry into final design, and then finally that full funding grant agreement when you're ready to get going on construction. And then if there are differences, identifies the sources of those differences to the extent that it can. The five required topic areas are project scope, capital costs, service levels, operating and maintenance costs, and ridership. Ridership being one of the, the emphasis of the, the studies because it is so complex and there's so much going on in, in terms of predictions and measuring the performance after. And then there's optional topic areas that one line, the BRT in Cleveland, did an economic development analysis of their line and how that's been affected um, from that project. And when we do the east side streetcar project before and after study in the next year or two, we're going to be looking at economic development analysis there as well. So a little bit additional background, like I mentioned, New Starts program. It's very important. It's actually the largest uh, source of discretionary funds in the federal budget, so there's a lot of eyes on it. In uh, 1990, I think his name is Don Pickrell, uh, issued a report that looked at some of the, the more modern but the first transit capital projects in the country, and those included, in our case, the, the east side, the Banfield light rail, and they also included the light rail system, the first startup in San Diego, and it included the the subway system in D.C. The findings from that report were not positive. They, they primarily indicated that costs were about 50 percent higher than what they were said to be at the earliest stages, and ridership was about 50 percent lower. Uh, so all the numbers in the wrong directions and a, a pretty big discrepancy. So there's been a lot of eyes on this, and being it, having it be a discretionary pot of money, there's a lot of politics involved. So FTA has been increasing the oversight in this program because it's such a large amount of money. And that includes the introduction of project management oversight contractors. These are assigned to every grantee, and they run through the process with you through the planning phases. You meet with them monthly. They evaluate your applications at the various milestones. And then they're there during the project implementation as the project's being constructed. And they evaluate risks and and give you advice as you're moving forward. And they also give very critical advice to FTA on whether or not FTA should move forward with you and give you that, that funding. 
Then there's been the introduction of cost effectiveness calculations by FTA. These are uh, measures that take into account projected ridership, projected costs of the project, and projected operating and maintenance costs. And in the Bush administration, these were emphasized to the extent that if you didn't meet the cost effectiveness measure, you couldn't proceed. Uh, in the Obama administration, it's been uh, balanced with other measures, including the environment and economic development. And then risk assessments, uh, mentioned a little bit about PMOCs. This is something they do. The risk assessments have been formalized into the process so that you need to make sure that you've addressed these risks before you can enter the full funding grant agreement. And then finally, there's the before and after studies, which are used to, to do that last step of evaluation. And then they help feed back into the loop of the New Starts process so that when FTA is evaluating new projects, they can look back and see how well certain things worked, and they can adjust their metrics. So just a, a brief rundown of the requirements of the, F, of the before and after study. The requirement came into place in 2001. In 2005, in order to provide a, a common means of comparison, they introduced standard capital costs, standard cost category format, and that allows you to evaluate the costs over the course of the project from preliminary engineering to final design to full funding grant agreement to the as-built conditions, and also compare projects around the country. Uh, then in Safety Lou, the Transportation Reauthorization Bill in 2005, uh, FTA was required to begin reporting annually on each of the new starts before and after reports. And uh, they've been doing so ever since. The first ones were just letters saying there were no reports, but now there's actually, they're starting to come in more regularly. And the findings from those are also, we're finding a lot of similarities. And then preservation of the ridership forecasts, that was the emphasis of these studies in the past, and it still continues to be to some extent. But uh, the preservation of ridership forecasts really requires that you've preserved the, the, met, the model documentation and the model itself, the software, in order to replicate those forecasts given the as, as actual and as-built conditions of the project. And that allows FTA to really evaluate how well your predictions were and what went wrong and where. So this chart only goes to eight. This is really small numbers. Uh, the yellow line was completed in 2008. I'll be talking about that. West was completed in 2013. And the green line in 2014, we're still waiting for that report to come out from FTA, but I've just seen a draft yesterday, in fact. So that should be coming out within the next month or two. So the report contents are really based around these three uh, sections here. First, you want to analyze what was built. So it talks about what were the as-built conditions, what's the service you're providing on the ground, um, what's the scope of the project, evaluate how transit service changed before versus after, and then also compare the pr predictions at each of those milestones to what is happening actually on the ground. And then identify those, uh, identify the findings, those discrepancies, and make some recommendations for future projects. So I'm just going to run through the, the five topic areas and what the questions the report's trying to answer. What was built for project scope? What did we plan to build at each of these stages? And then why are there differences? And I have a picture up here of the Herald Overcrossing. This is on the Portland-Milwaukee project. In the preliminary engineering phases, we were planning on doing an at-grade crossing here. But during negotiations with the railroad, we ended up not being able to do that. They needed a grade-separated crossing. So initially, when this bridge was built, it looked like an arch. People were calling it the bridge to the nowhere. But the reason for that is negotiations with the railroad are just difficult and challenging, not for us, but for projects around the country. So that's some added scope that will get discussed in that project's before and after study. Capital costs, what did it cost? What did we think it would cost? And why are there differences? And then you'll see similarities in the types of questions. Same thing with service levels. Operating and maintenance costs, which is really, it's really comes into play when you've got a new mode that you're introducing in your region. Uh, for us, commuter rail was a new mode. Uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, light rail was a new mode. So looking at those types of modes and how well did you accurately forecast them. For us, when we do new light rail extensions, there's generally no story there because we've already been operating light rail. We know how much it costs per mile, so there's nothing to really look at. But you can get into some discrepancies. And then, of course, ridership. What, what is the ridership after it settles? Like I mentioned, it's generally looked at about two years after opening. What did we expect in those transportation demand models, which are fairly complex, 
creatures and why are there differences and there's a lot of work that goes into looking at those. So how did TriMet do on these three projects? I'll start with uh, their order of completion. The Interstate Max, for those that don't know, uh, 5.8 miles It's on an urban arterial. It replaced local bus service. There was a Line 5 there before. It has 10 stations, two park and ride lots. It's a $350 million project when it was completed. And that includes reallocating funds that were left over because it was completed well under budget and using that money to purchase additional rolling stock for the light rail fleet and then also purchase some property for transit and development on the corridor. And today we're seeing about 15,200 riders. So the project came in under budget, and that's not a small task, so I emphasize that with the underline. Um, the ridership projections were a little bit more mixed. Uh, the opening year was projected to be about 14,000. Actually, in 2005, it was about 12,000. Uh, in FTA's view, that's close enough. That's actually a lot closer than most projects. So they were pretty satisfied with that outcome. But actually, we're on target to meet our horizon year projection. And that's important because these studies only address the opening year. But in a region like ours where we're emphasizing infill development and you start to see changes in transit behavior and in travel behavior, uh, looking at that horizon year is very important. Uh, this is a, a figure that's displaying how the ridership changed from the year before to the year after. Line 5 had about 7,000 riders a day. Almost overnight, the Interstate Max uh, almost doubles that to t close to the 12,000 that I mentioned before. But TriMet decided to reallocate the hours of service that were on Line 5 into the adjacent bus routes in the corridor. Overall, bus ridership went up as well. So this isn't a case of light rail just taking the bus ridership and reconfiguring it. It's, there was a 30% jump in transit ridership in this corridor when the project was completed. So overall, it's a pretty successful story in, from a ridership perspective. Some of the takeaways are there was a little bit of luck involved. Uh, it was built at the right time. Construction inflation was low. You had the dot-com bust. You had post-9-11 recession. So contracting turned out to be uh, an easier task than we thought. We also took use of a new contracting method. I don't think it's new, but construction manager, general contractor. That's where you bring the contractor on early on and they're involved in the design process. And that there's a feedback loop that helps you keep your costs under control. And that per perhaps is one reason why we came in so far under budget. And then of course experience matters. And this is a repeated theme, at least in the TriMet projects. We've been able to keep engineers and, and project managers on from one project to the next. And those people have experience with change orders from contractors in managing design and all the things that happen out in the field. So they've been able to keep costs on track. And then the issue I just mentioned with ridership, the opening year ridership number is really what the before and after study looks at, but horizon year is really what we're trying to look at. There's a little bit of discrepancy there between FTA and us on that. The West Commuter Rail, I'll spend a little bit more time talking about this because there is more of a story here from a before and after perspective. It's a 15-mile commuter rail. It's the first one in our region, uh, one of the first in the country that doesn't go downtown. Uh, it's shared with the freight railroad, five stations, so they're f pretty far apart, four park and rides. This is ultimately a premium transit service. It's very fast, very comfortable. Uh, there's even Wi-Fi on, on board. There's about 2,000 daily riders today. Now, the cost estimate for this project in 2001 was $85 million. So significantly lower than what we ended up building. Well, why is that? Well, in 2001, they had a completely different assumption of what they're building. They assumed that they're replacing maybe one out of three ties on the freight railroad, that they're maybe doing a little bit of track upgrades. Um, when this project actually got completed, we almost rehabilitated the entire line. So significantly different scope. Uh, but if you just take out the fact that Construction inflation alone had a huge impact on, on this project's cost. That's almost a third of the cost discrepancy was the construction inflation during that time period between 2001 and 2009 when it finally opened. Construction inflation was twice as high as anyone projected. All of our projections were based on the 1990s, which were in the threes. Uh, during the 2000s, they were closer to six and a little bit higher. And that's because of global demand for commodities and labor, especially in the construction business. So that's something definitely to consider for this project. And it's a recurring theme with other projects that were completed during that time period. 
So just some of the assumptions that were incorrect in, during that 2001 estimate, if they actually built what they assumed in 2001, it'd probably be under budget, and it would be open in 2004, but that's not how it turned out. The project scope changed. Uh, freight railroads were a big part of that change. They owned the right-of-way for the most part, and so they had huge control and leverage over what we had to build. Also, when the project was only $85 million, we were only asking for $25 million from the federal government. That qualifies as an exempt from their review process. No hurdles to jump over. But when we started adding scope in, con in concert with negotiations with the railroad, we're not exempt anymore. So that adds a whole new layer of evaluation that delays the project further, so we're subject to more of that construction inflation. So it's just a, a, a bunch of factors that combine together that led to that cost overestimate. And this is an oversimplification, but if there are additional questions at the end, I'll be happy to answer them. Now, the ridership range, uh, the initial estimates, this is a new mode, by the way. So initially, there were about 2,400 opening year and 4,600 in 2020, the horizon year. Um, then in negotiations with FTA and in reviewing the travel demand model, we eventually came down to, oh, okay, we think this opening year ridership is going to be somewhere around 1,600. And in 2009, when this project opened, there were 1,200 average daily riders. It opened at the, the depth of the national recession, which was felt locally at a heightened level. In 2001, the recession is starting to come to an end. Uh, there's actually a lot of ridership growth on this line. So as the economy's improved and employment has increased, this line, which only operates during the peak periods, the ridership numbers are incre improving as well. Until finally in 2000, or in 2014, we have 2,000 riders. That seems to be where it's starting to settle. Um, some of the key factors in predicting ridership on this line, and they actually turned out to be fairly on target, uh, was the employment and the economy. If you get the employment right in the land use projections, the model will give you the right outputs. Uh, the park and rides and transfers. FTA had a hard time trusting that there were people that would park and ride and then transfer to a different transit vehicle and sometimes even make two transfers. Uh, for an example, someone in the west side is driving to a park and ride on west side max. They're taking the, the blue line to Beaverton. Then they're transferring to commuter rail. And then they're transferring again to a smart bus to get to their job at Xerox. And there actually are cases of that occurring. Um, so that's something that the, the model was really depending on, and we're, we're actually seeing that out in the field. And there are a lot of transfers. Only 17% of rides on West don't need to transfer. So most people are, are making a transfer for this system to work. Uh, and then the travel patterns emphasize West Side, primarily travel, intra-West Side travel from the Southwest, um, Wilsonville, Tualatin, to Hill, Hillsboro and Beaverton. And we did see that. Here's a, just a, a quick snapshot of the origins and destinations on this project. Uh, they're primarily centered within the corridor and within the, the Blue Line area. And there's a few dots downtown. Um, you know, we worked with FTA to remove trips that we didn't think would actually use West to get downtown, especially when there were parallel express bus services that they could take from that same starting point. And that turned out to be, for the most part, pretty true. So it's a good thing that we took those trips out. Um, but overall, less than 10% of ridership is heading downtown Portland. And that was hard for FTA to believe, but that's actually what's happening. And FTA kept asking the questions as we were going through this before and after study. Well, why are people taking this line when there's no parking charges? Why are they driving to a park and ride, transferring? It just doesn't make any sense. But when you look at the travel or the, the traffic and the unreliability of traffic on 217, that's a real impediment, and it's a long distance to travel, and this is a fast transit mode. So there's a reason why people are doing it. Uh, about 60% of West riders are actually new to transit, so they, they haven't been using transit before the project opened. So that's a pretty big number. Some of the takeaways from this project are FTA oversight growing equals delays, construction inflation, the high unemployment at the opening um, really, uh, really hurt our ridership measures. And then the freight railroad was a huge component of the cost overruns, leading to scope changes and additional costs. So then I'll go into the max green line. Uh, 
As FTA likes to say, there's no story here. This project came in on budget, on time, ridership looked good, but here's the, the rundown. It's a 8.3 mile light rail extension in two segments, one in I-205 with eight stations, and then downtown Portland Mall, which we're right adjacent to, with seven stations, seven station pairs. And there's six park and rides on the I-205 portion. Uh, came in at $575 million, and there, today there's about 20,400 riders. When we did the study, there were actually 24,000 riders. The difference between when we did the study in 2011, or the evaluation, and now is that the free rail zone went away. And that's one of the, the big influences, fare policy. So looking into depth at the cost estimates, you know, early on our cost estimate was actually about $495 million in 2004. But when you apply the current inflation rates that we actually experienced, that cost estimate using those base dollar values translated into $595 million. So FTA requires you to look and pull out the inflation in order to see if your base cost estimates were valid. And in our case, they were more than valid. They predicted that uh, they predicted the project would cost 2% more than what it actually did. In 2006, when we entered that full funding grant agreement, we said exactly what we thought it would cost, and we came in at that number. Uh, predicted ridership was 25,500 for the 2009 opening, and the horizon year for this project was 2025, and we're looking at about 46,000 riders. The service on this line never opened to what we said it would be. That's a big challenge uh, for the ridership numbers, and even today we're still well below what we said we would provide. Uh, initially, we wanted to provide 10-minute service during the peak periods and 15-minute service for the rest of the day and on the weekends. Today we're providing, or at least in 2011, it was about 17 minutes during the peak periods in the midday, and then as late as 30 to 40-minute headways during the off-peak. So it wasn't exactly what we had expected from the model, so that led to some of the, the lower ridership. Some of the takeaways from this project, at least from a capital cost perspective, which was a good story, the project scope changes were very minimal. We benefited from the fact that when I-205 was built in the 1970s, at least that segment, there was a transit way dedicated for this project. It could have been a BRT, it could have been a light rail, doesn't matter, but the light, but the the right-of-way was dedicated, and in fact, there was even a tunnel under I-205 waiting for this project to happen. So that kept project scope changes minimal. And in the downtown portion, we had our own right-of-way. We worked with the city of Portland to use the transit mall, which we were already using for buses. And then, as I mentioned with Interstate Max, we had extensive local experience in implementing these projects. We were able to keep the cost down. Um, this project was done at the same time as Wes. And unlike West, we didn't have to deal with the railroads. So we still had the construction inflation concerns, but we were able to use that exten extensive experience in our staff to keep those projects scope and the cost down. In terms of travel forecasting, there were some lessons learned. Uh, the park and ride behavior in the model wasn't developed uh, as it probably should have early on. And Metro has since made some modifications that have addressed this. But initially, the park and ride model from 2004, I think it was, was showing that park and riders were going everywhere in the region. In reality, what we're finding is that over 90% of people that are using the park and rides on I-205 are traveling only to places where there's parking charges, so that or parking restrictions. That's downtown Portland, that's Lloyd District. We're also learning that the walk access environment on I-205 really isn't as great as it should have been uh, or as it could be. So <clears throat> some of the mode of access was a little bit less than what we had expected on I-205. Uh, the land use is a big difference from what the model showed and what's actually on the ground. That's largely a result of the, the national recession when it opened. And then the service assumptions were incorrect, as I mentioned. Here's a chart of the, the model assumptions for employment in this corridor. They're way off. The forecasted growth was 15% in downtown, 7% on the Banfield, 22% on I-205. Uh, the actual growth was not up. It was actually down. So the discrepancy was about 23% for downtown. It was about 17% for the Banfield and about 21% for the I-205 corridor. These are big differences. Uh, actually, the population forecast for the region were close to on target 
but the employment because of the recession really hurt this project and the outcomes that we're measuring today. So we'll look at a little bit at other projects. I've got a little bit of time here. Uh, Front Runner is a commuter rail project in Salt Lake City, about 44 miles, quite a bit longer than our commuter rail. Built at the same time, though, so it experienced quite a bit of uh, cost, in f cost growth over the course of its project. Uh, but taking out construction inflation, which was so high during this period, it was still 34% over budget, similar to what we had for Wes. And one of the reasons for that, it's a freight railroad corridor. Uh, it opened with 5,300 weekday trips, a little bit uh, lower than what it was predicted to operate at the time that the feds decided to fund this project, but a lot lower than what was predicted early on. So Front Runner had the same problems Wes had. Um, and so when talking to FTA, I thought I would have a, a long story to tell them about how all of these problems occurred. They already knew it because they were working with Salt Lake City. All these same problems came out not just with us but across the country. Construction inflation really hurt transit projects during this period. Working with freight railroads was a real big uh, issue for Front Runner as well as us. And then it opened at the same time as us in the middle of the recession. So the ridership really wasn't as good as it should have been. These are reflections a little bit of the, the pick rail report, but there's better reasons for it today. And then there was some public pressure that changed the service plan. The commuter rail in Salt Lake City was replacing express bus service, and the community wasn't happy about that. And so eventually the transit district pushed as much as they could, and they replaced some express bus service, but they couldn't replace it all. So what they actually had out on the ground when it opened was different than what their transportation models projected. Uh, then here is a light rail project in Phoenix. This is the first light rail project in Phoenix. Uh, this is actually a, an, an interesting story. It's 20 miles on urban arterials, kind of interstate max, like uh, 28 stations uh, and a $1.4 billion project, uh, which is pretty close to what they expected in, in the FFGA, the full funding grant agreement. But actually, the ridership is the big story here. Uh, the earliest estimates were about 26,000 average daily riders, and that was for 2020. So that's looking out really far. They thought, yeah, well, I think we'll get 26,000 riders by then. Opening day, they're like, whoa, we got 40,000 riders. Where did they come from? Um, here's some reasons. The universities in Phoenix were growing quite a bit. Uh, Arizona State University opened a second campus in downtown Phoenix, and they're connected by the two campuses by this light rail. And there was an unanticipated growth of carless, low-income households. Those are basically undocumented immigrants that were flying kind of under the radar from the Census Bureau and other uh, federal organizations. They didn't realize how many people and how much demand there was for a transit service of this kind. Uh, in terms of the capital costs, there were some minor tweaks here and there. Uh, in this project, probably a lesser degree than others, but local requirements added some costs. Uh, they had to the city changed from you have to replace utilities within 10 feet of the right-of-way to you have to replace utilities within 16 feet of the right-of-way. So bunched in a whole bunch of new utility relocation. Uh, the travel times actually improved, though, because some of these local requirements. The, the city actually required that the transit agency replace all the signal systems to allow signal priority. That boosted the travel times, and, and it helped the project in the end. But it also added some costs. And then finally, there, there was a little bit of underestimated capital or operating and maintenance cost for this project, and that's the new mode story. So if you're introducing a new mode, you may not have that experience to how this is going to fit within your existing transit system. And there were about 4 to $5 million underestimating their operating and maintenance cost annually. And then we've got a, a BRT project. This is the Euclid Corridor in Cleveland, Ohio. About 7.1 mile project uh, on paper. There's about 4.4 miles of exclusive right of way for the BRT itself. So the rest of that right of way is actually just they built some nicer stops that complemented the stops in the real nice part. Uh, it was a $197 million project. Uh, that was actually about 10 to 28 percent lower than what they thought they would spend on this project. It's primarily because they cut back on scope, they knew they didn't have enough money. So they didn't do full-scale street restorations that they had planned all the way through. They limited it to that 4.4-mile section. There were about 14,300 riders uh, in opening day or 2011. 
uh, early on, some of the, the ridership forecasts were a little bit higher, and perhaps they, they didn't have an articulated enough model to, to really isolate the effects of this new starts project. But at the time that they entered the full funding grant agreement, they were pretty close. Some of the lessons learned from this project that while well, scope reductions, if you're able to accomplish them, which is not often, uh, they can actually save you money and you can come in under budget. Uh, there were travel time savings as a result of the project. So the BRT, just by itself, uh, providing some exclusive right-of-way in that 4.4-mile section saved about 21% travel time over the previous bus that was serving that corridor. Uh, they were able to provide additional service with only $1 million net operating maintenance costs. Uh, for comparison, the Phoenix system costs $30 million a year to operate. So this one only cost $1 million more than what they were spending before. Uh, but another part of the story is that there's, like other projects, a great national recession that occurred when this project opened. They had to cut bus service throughout the corridor except for this line. So you see a lot of other bus use transferring over to this line, and that's why this corridor is still doing really well. This corridor is up 31% in ridership. Uh, the rest of the system is down 22%. But the, system, the, the transit agency was able to focus their resources on this quarter because they're actually saving money in some more efficient mode and um, <clears throat> they were able to provide more service with essentially no additional costs. So just a quick recap of lessons learned. I think I'm actually coming in on time and then I can take some questions. So lessons learned, local requirements change. Uh, you can get stuck with a lot more scope than you thought if if your local entities are adding project scope. In this region, we've been fortunate to have a land use final order on a couple of our light rail projects, and that minimized the ability of the local jurisdictions to add scope to the project. But that's not the case in other regions. Uh, political pressure can delay a project. In this picture, uh, I don't know if you've been following the Honolulu heavy rail story, but they've got a huge project, and they keep going from one administration to the other, and there's constant struggles on whether or not they're going to build it. All of these struggles result in delays, which equals huge increase in costs. And then anytime you're dealing with freight railroads, be prepared for a brutal fight and add costs to your project. Some of the capital cost lessons learned are construction inflation can vary quite a bit. You need to pay attention to national and federal or uh, international demand for products and resources. And to the extent you can, what we've learned at TriMet is you want to pre-order, you want to get your contracts out, you want to get your materials in as soon as possible to eliminate the effect of construction inflation on your project. Schedule, if that schedule slips, that means your budget is going to break quite a bit. Scope changes for a variety of reasons, be they the freight railroads or others, are going to increase your capital costs. It's easy correlation. And then the local experience helps you deal with unexpected uh, occurrences or situations on your project. For service levels, uh, when you're ex replacing express or local bus service, you need to be prepared for the community's pushback if they're not on board with your plan. Um, economic cycles can reduce your ability to provide service in the case of the Green Line for us. Uh, in the case of the Phoenix Line, they were able to increase their or improve their tra travel times through transit priority, which improved their service level. And that was also the case in the Euclid BRT corridor, where they improved travel times. The operating and maintenance costs, if you're a new transit mode, you may have some challenges there. FTA is now applying a lot more scrutiny on projects and regions that don't have that mode previously. Um, and for our green line um, before and after study, we're going to include as an appendix our light rail methodology for, in general, how we estimate costs. And it'll help other regions consider, oh, I didn't think about that. I didn't think about station maintenance or this or that. Um, so that'll help in the long run. And then public demands for service on the buses, express buses in particular, can affect how much you're spending on the corridor. And then if there's a recession, which there's really no way to plan ahead, but you may be expected to reduce your service uh, throughout the region or in the corridor. <clears throat> and in freight railroads, there's additional costs that you need to be prepared for. Uh, we have to carry an insurance policy for operating on their railroad. That's pretty high. It comes over a million dollars a year. 
So if, if you're not prepared for those kind of figures, you, you need to kind of get on board with the railroad. And then ridership lessons learned, these are kind of basic, but the land use forecasts, if the model doesn't know what actually going to be out there in terms of population and employment, it's not going to be right in terms of predicting your ridership. Uh, service changes, <clears throat> if you don't provide a realistic service plan in your model, then you're not going to get the same ridership as we experience when it's built. Um, the travel time, if there's an increase in travel time for some reason, or a decrease in the case of, uh, of Phoenix, then your ridership is going to increase a little bit. And then the fare policy, in the case of the Green Line, the removal of Fairless Square and the free rail zone resulted in a, a lower ridership after the, the evaluation was done. So what are we doing for the Portland-Milwaukee project, which is under construction right outside our door here? <clears throat> well, we're preserving all of the, the capital costs and their standard cost categories. We're doing a pretty good job, though, in terms of the project. Just a, a basic picture. The project's looking like it's going to be under budget and on schedule. Uh, the bus service planning, we're dealing with some of these changes. Some of them are a little bit different than what we assumed previously. Uh, previously, we had assumed the Line 19 would use the new Tillicum Crossing and have access to OMSI and the South Waterfront. That's not how we're going to implement it, at least in our current plan. Um, it's still out for public comment, but this is the final draft after numerous iterations. So that's what I'm going off right now. Um, one other thing is that we're n instead of stubbing the express bus service on McLaughlin, we're going to continue that, except we're going to run it across the, McCat or the, the Selwood Bridge. So that, if implemented that way, would be a, a big change. We're actually conducting before surveys on our transit line. That helps us determine the on-off behavior and the trans travel behavior and trip destinations in the corridor. We're doing that now, and we're going to continue it through spring 2015. And then we're going to continue that. <coughs> we're going to repeat that uh, process again about two years after opening, either spring 2017 or fall 2017. And that closes my presentation, so i um, happy to take any questions. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, great pr pr presentation. Uh, first, I, I lived in uh, Phoenix before. Actually, uh, to the, that's a metro, uh, that's a light rail from Tempe to Phoenix because of two campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, they stopped by uh, uh, the airport, the Sky Harbor near the Washington. Yeah. So that's connected uh, by another like uh, 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 train. Okay. Yeah. So I think that put, could also pro probably contribute a lot to ridership because I saw a lot of people just luggage on the mm -hmm. other. Uh, it's possible. I, I don't know what their model included in terms of uh, anticipating <clears throat> transfers to and from the airport. When I flew there uh, a few years ago, it was a bus that took us. I didn't see many people myself, but uh, that's a, a connection that they may or may not have gotten right in their model. <coughs> Broadcasting. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is that uh, I looked at you know few of those uh, samples examples. I mean, uh, similar like, you know Portland or Oregon, we have a strict uh, uh, land use policy. We have the UGB, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of modeling, you know, do the TDM traffic demand modeling or both both forecasting. Mm -hmm. Does other cities have those kind of you know st as strong as strict land use policies? And how do you account for that difference in terms of you know, how that affect, uh, impact employment, population, or in, in housing? Mm -hmm. Because if we just keep, you know, well, the rest of the metro policies that they want to re uh, fulfill the next five years or less apply by infield development rather than you know, run that expansion of the, uh, the urban growth boundary. Right. So I'm just, how do you account this? Well, for the most part, those other projects, we've only looked at their opening years, so we don't know if there's going to be much growth on those lines in the, the future. But it's true that in our region, we do have the extra benefit, and we do emphasize that as well, though, in our forecasts. Uh, in their forecasts, I'm assuming that they don't have the extent of that growth um, because it is pretty much uh, unrestrained to some extent. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably the best answer I can give right now. Um, in the case of Phoenix, you know, they were way off, but that's for a different reason. Yes. Their models just weren't accounting for a whole population. Yes. Well, this was on one of the last two 
actually to the Dartmouth campus, I think later this year or something. Okay. Uh, and so it's expansion of Dartmouth campuses. So yeah, when well, I was there a few years ago, the cranes everywhere. It looked pretty impressive. Construction inflation is for those of us who haven't sure. been built. Yeah. <laughs> so there's consumer price index. That's what most people are familiar with, the CPI. And that really deals with consumer goods, uh, the cost of gas, the cost of things you buy at the grocery store, your durable goods like televisions and appliances and whatnot. Construction inflation has to do with the commodities and materials and labor market. So they're a little bit more focused on those uh, products. Um, for our construction inflation, it's actually, we tied it to the Seattle market because that's what, they're in the Northwest, they're similar in environment, and they have similar connections to the construction industry and materials worldwide. Um, so that's basically the difference, is it's, it's only construction projects. Some of the indices that can be used for construction are taken from the state highway agencies. So what does it cost the state highway agency to build a project, and how does that change over time? Um, those can sometimes be helpful, but because these light rail projects and rail projects in general are doing a lot more than just paving and asphalt, we generally go with the construction inflation. But there's not very much difference, actually, between the two. But they're both focused on actual boots on the ground. What does it cost to do something? What's the cost of labor? All right, so I have a question from our, um, one of our online viewers. Um, so he says, peak hour headways on both the yellow line and green line remain far below the service levels promised to FTA and the FMGAs. What has TriMet learned from this uh, that will be applied to the Portland-Milwaukee light rail, and what are the planned opening day headways for that light rail out of state? Sure. Um, one of the lessons learned, not just for us, but for FTA, is that they really need to tie the restriction on the grantee and tie them to that commitment. Previously, they didn't have, we said we would do it, but they didn't require it either. It was more of a statement rather than a requirement. In our current FFGA with, uh, with the Federal Transit Administration for Portland, Milwaukee, we're actually required to provide that headway. And so we have to do a 10-minute headway during the peak periods and then a 15-minute during the off-peak periods. So I, that's a lesson learned not for us, not just for us, but for FTA. One of the, the projects that spurred that requirement wasn't necessarily the green line in our experience. It was the fact that in, in, um, in Salt Lake City, they didn't actually operate that commuter rail the entire length of the line. They ended up replacing one leg of it with a bus service. So FTA got a little bit peeved about that. And so that kind of spurred the requirement more than anything. Um, I'm curious if the FTA continues to monitor these projects, like toward the horizon year, and then also how the horizon year is defined, like if it's just a set um, uh, time, uh, set number of years for each project, or if it kind of depends on like the particular city's, you know, like growth policy and whatever. Uh, interesting question, because FTA is actually pulled back away from the horizon year. They're less interested in it. They're actually focusing more of the evaluation on the opening year. And they're requiring you to do evaluation and ridership projections based on your existing land use. So they want to take land use completely out of the question because there have been so many mispredictions of land use growth that they want to separate that out completely. Um, what was your second part? <clears throat> How do they define the horizon year if it's the same oh. for every project? Uh, it differs. It depends on your region's met metropolitan forecasting model and what your region's long-range model year is. In our region right now, we're moving from 2035 to 2040. So that will, in our future projects, we're going to be a 2040 horizon year. And when the green line was done, it was 2025. When the yellow line was done, it was 2020. Because that's where we were with our regional transportation plan. And that's generally what we use. And FTA has some general guidance for how to define that, but it's generally... Use whatever your, your local MPO, your Metropolitan Planning Organization, is using already. Yeah, Bob. Joe, is there anyone who's actually paying enough attention to these reports that's affecting their thinking about 
uh, what kind of investments are appropriate for the federal level and the local level? Uh, you know, the reports are pretty limited in their scope. Uh, in FTA's mind, it's purely a regulatory thing. It was handed down to them from Safety Lou and from previous re legislation. Uh, there are annual reports to Congress, and the last one was so late, it actually only got sent to Congress when there was a topic on Capitol Hill that was talking about transit. So they brought it up at that point. Um, I don't know how they're being used at a political level, but that's the primary audiences, the, the legislatures, the, le the, the federal legislature. Is this an exercise in reporting, or has it been useful for TRIMET? Oh, about projects? It's been extremely useful. The data we collect on these, on these uh, before and after studies is useful throughout the agency. <clears throat> we use them for planning other projects. Actually, so right now we're, we're doing the before surveying for Portland, Milwaukee. We're using that data for uh, the Powell Division corridor. Um, I've provided uh, training and at within TriMet on our lessons learned. It's generally because of our local experience within the TriMet staff. It's A lot of it's not too new, but there are some segments that are new. So we're trying to keep that knowledge and spreading it out. And that's why I'm here today as well. But um, I have been sharing this information throughout TriMet too. Yeah, Phil? Um, the comment you just made about how FTA is beginning to take land use out of the equation for ridership projections anyway. Um, it's a big deal because light rail and any of these high capacity modes are somewhat premised or largely premised on their influence on development in a region. Has there been pushback from TriMet or other properties on that? Is there a way to come up with a range? I mean, the conservative approach that they seem to be going towards is understandable, but you would think that there could be some kind of a range that would be allowed. Yeah, I, I think if you're only relying on your current land use, uh, then you're, you've gone overboard, basically. But the FTA does make an allowance, and yeah, TriMet and the region would push back on that. Uh, FTA has made the allowance that you have the option of averaging the ridership from that current base year forecast with your horizon year. So there's some consideration for horizon year land use, but it's been minimized. Uh, I'm curious uh, how much um, the people working on these projects um, are working with TriMet's uh, community relations arm, because I know these budgets can come under intense scrutiny, particularly when they're over budget. So, I mean, Whenever there's, you know, a quarterly report, is that when, you know, the PR arm is in the room, making sure that they're mediating how it, how it gets out to the press, or I'm just wondering about that? Um, it hasn't been too much of an issue for TriMet, at least on the Portland-Milwaukee project, because we've been under budget, but, um, but yeah, we, from TriMet's perspective, we always keep our community affairs team in the picture on all of these I issues, especially when they deal with scope. We, we continue to have what are called citizen advisory committee meetings, even though the project's already been decided uh, years ago and is under construction. And the, through that outlet, we let the public know, and we also have pretty pretty impressive outreach network now. Um, we let them know where the project stands, what's changing, if anything, and why it's changing. And then if there's cases where we can solicit some public impact or some, so, some public feedback and make an impact on what is actually being built, we'll, we'll make that opportunity available too. And community affairs is on top of it, at least for our organization. There's a lot of connection there. And it's, it's really a benefit of doing all of that community outreach in-house.